Well, hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comment section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here. y'all spots and get ready for church but uh, thank you so much for being here tonight I just want to welcome you and uh, thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight uh, as we open up our, our worship I'm going to ask the praise team or Sherelle or whoever's singing for us tonight if they would come on up and I'm going to read for you our opening verse of scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, verse 11, which says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the Lord is our foundation. That's who we're going to sing about and learn about a little bit more tonight. If you would, please stand as we sing the solid rock. I'm going to read, Miss Kay, go back to that fourth verse again. I'm going to read that to y'all because I'm not really sure you realized what you were singing. <laughs> when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Let's sing it again. <laughs> when he shall come with trumpet sound, Stand. All of the ground is sinking 
Thank you, ladies, for that. If you have a prayer guide, we're going to look at a few things. I um, want to ask you to continue to lift up in prayer. Uh, Bob Bennett Sr., that's Bob Bennett's dad. He is still at Lexington Medical Center and in need of our prayers. Also, Jamie Rogers, that name might not be familiar to many of you. Jamie Rogers is the Director of Missions at the Columbia Metro Baptist Association. And uh, he is really not doing well. He's had some different health things. He's been in the hospital. So he is in need of our prayers. And then also, Mary Kirkland is having a surgery next Friday. Uh, she's got to be there at 5, 10 a.m. in the morning. So, or 5.40, I think. But anyway, pray for Miss Mary. Also, be in prayer for Jackie Johnson. She has a fever tonight. But she also has a surgery coming up uh, on November the 15th. So please be in prayer for Jackie with that. Also, please be in prayer for Lauren Sneed. Lauren Sneed was in a car accident last night, had a dislocated thumb. She's sore today. But other than that, she's doing okay. Uh, please continue to lift up uh, Hayward Kelly. Hayward Kelly uh, is not here tonight. He's having a lot of congestion, had to go to the doctor today, and is just not feeling well. Uh, and if you know Hayward, he would be here if he could be. Uh, but doctor said no. So uh, pray for him. Also, please be in prayer uh, for Alice Carton. That is Sherry Kelly's mother, Tracy Rich's mother. She's having some, some help things going on. So just be in prayer for her. And then also Judy Lowry. Uh, as you can see there, uh, we have one church member in the hospital tonight, Ed Dorowski. Uh, it says that he is in 6131 North Tower. Okay, hold up, hold up. Not yet. <laughs> she just stole my thunder. It's okay. Uh, you can leave it up there, Kay. Um, so this is Brother Ed. He is in room 354 uh, in the Central Tower. And uh, Ed Dorowski, if you can put it back up, Kay. Uh, Ed Dorowski, uh, actually last night, um, his deacon, uh, Keith Ray, and I had a conversation on the phone. Um, the nurses had told Deacon Keith and Mike that uh, Ed's organs were shutting down and that he had a heart infection. And so usually you don't recover from that. And so we sent out some texts last night. We had some folks praying. And when I got to the office this morning, Velvet said, there's three missed calls for you from Ed Dorowski. And I said, wow, that's awesome. And so uh, we went to see Ed today, and he's waving at everybody. He was completely coherent. He actually walked today. And so Ed is doing great. So give God praise for that. Give God praise for that. So, so happy for Ed. I don't, you know, they were talking about moving him to a different room. But if you want to be encouraged and you want to be blessed, go see Ed tomorrow. Or go see him Friday. Uh, he needs our support right now as he continues to get better. Um, there's other folks that are in the hospital that I don't have the license to share, so just pray for them, right? Unspoken prayer needs in those situations. Uh, several things I want to draw to your attention. Don't forget if you signed up for the, uh, the first aid CPR training, don't forget about that uh, from 9 to 2 this Saturday. Also want to let you know uh, that at the close of tonight's worship service, we will be having a very, very brief uh, church conference and the purpose of that is to elect uh, messengers to the state convention meeting that's coming up it'll be very quick I promise um, and I think that's all we're talking about so uh, you don't have to worry about that the other prayer needs to see here don't forget family fun night you need to sign up for that by tonight if you and your children plan on attending that uh, the youth are doing a headstone restoration and decorating the graveyard with American flags for our veterans. Um, keep that in mind. There's a grief gathering group at 3 o'clock in the fellowship hall this coming Sunday. And then choir practice. I do want to let you know a, not, a week from tonight, we need all of the shoe boxes back. Uh, so our goal this year is 400. Now, we've got a lot, but we don't have them all. So please bring those back. You can lay them up here leave them in the welcome center, leave them with Margie or some of those ladies, and they can help you with that. I uh, do want to uh, ask you to pray for our associate pastor. I think he's with our youth tonight. Uh, but Pastor Chris will be preaching uh, this coming Sunday morning. Hannah and I will not be here. We're going to leave Saturday. We're coming back Tuesday. Uh, we're going to a mystery place. I'm just let you guess. But anyway, we're, we're going to spend some time, much needed time together, and uh, gear up for the Christmas months and everything that's coming on with that. So uh, Pastor Chris is going to take good care of you, I'm sure. If you need anything while we're gone, you can contact him or any of our deacons, and we will see you next Wednesday. But we don't leave till Saturday. 
But uh, any prayer requests you'd like to share at this time? Oh, one second. I got one in the back, Claire. Raising the hands, raising the hands. Tommy? Okay, your neighbor, Brandy Ray. Clara. Okay, Ronald Smith is sick, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you teaching for? I got you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mia Draldi. Yeah, Terry. Okay, all right, all right. Chris, raising the hands, guys, raising the hands. Chris for dream. Yep, we mentioned Ed before you came in. Charles? Yep, 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 Sherelle. Okay. Donna? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Pam? Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, if that's all, I want to remind you we need to pray for the preaching of God's Word. Nobody mentioned that. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to you tonight and lift up these requests. Father, I can't remember them all by name, but Lord, I know that you do, and I ask that you would be uh, with each one of these needs tonight as you are the great physician and the great healer. And please be with us as we get ready to open up your Word and as your Word is preached, Lord. And help us to remember to pray for the preaching of the Word, Lord, and to not take that for granted. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry, Randy. That's not the right one, I don't think. was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried for my burden. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, His life for mine, how could it ever be that He would die, God's Son would die, to save Scars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood 
to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy untold. His life for mine. His life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? God's son would die. Thank you so much, Sherelle, for that. He gave his life for me and you. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to find your way to Malachi. And uh, if you were with us this past Sunday morning, you noticed that we were in Malachi's chapter 1 and verses 2 through 5. And this past Sunday, I preached a sermon entitled, Does God Really Love Me? If you weren't here, I encourage you to go back and look at that. This sermon kind of builds upon each week, and so I encourage you to... Uh, keep up with them if, they're, if you're not here. I asked you the question Sunday, how does this passage show us that God really does love us? And we look at God's promise to love Israel and God's plan to lead Israel. Uh, and so tonight I want to talk to you about problems of the priest. And so if when you were coming in, if you did not get one, I've got, just like I did last week, I've got little handouts for you, uh, pieces of paper. So if you didn't get one of those, I encourage you to get one of those. When we Don't do it now. When we pray, sneak out, go grab one of those in the vestibule if you did not get one. But if you did, I encourage you to follow along. Also, I totally forgot, uh, Tim, I'm sorry, but Tim Smith, he's here tonight. I just saw him. His uncle passed this week. Uh, so please pray for Tim and his family during this situation. Um, and then also, Liz Henderson's uncle passed away as well. Uh, and I just want, you, want to remind you guys, I'm human. If I forget prayer requests, please understand, it's not intentional. Uh, so anyway, so let's talk tonight about problems of the priest. Uh, from Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, I want to give you the sermon in a sentence tonight. The priests of Israel at this time had major problems in the fact that they disrespected God's name, disobeyed God's necessities, and despised God's very nature. If we are not careful, we can find ourselves similar to these priests. Now, our number one problem, in my opinion, as Christians, is that we do not prioritize worship the way that the Lord intends for us to prioritize worship. I don't think worship is prioritized, and I'll just be honest, we, we as the church don't prioritize worship. We really don't know what worship is, in my opinion. Let me tell you what a few things that, uh, that worship looks like on a daily basis. Worship, and we have a few of these on the screen for you, worship is praying to the Lord. 
But not just praying, but worship is also listening to what the Lord has to say. So often we tell God everything we want Him to know, but we don't listen to what He has to say. And then worship is also obeying the Lord. Worship is praising the Lord. Worship is reading the Word. Worship is fellowshipping with the saints. These are all parts of worship, and I've missed a few here. Worship is also giving. Worship is also uh, sharing the word through evangelism. All of these different things. But to define worship, this is my definition of worship. Worship is defined by the attitude of your heart. Where your heart is, your worship will be as well. And what an absolute shame it is. To walk into any church, not just our church, but our church is included in this. To walk into any church, and instead of seeing people smiling and and so happy to be here, we're frowning. And you say, what's wrong? Well, the elevator's out. I'm upset about it. By the way, the elevator is out. And I've already heard about it. Let me tell you something. It's out of our control. Okay, well... I've got this complaint or I've got that complaint. Y'all, visitors don't want to hear that. They hear that in the rest of the world. When they come here, they should find worship. When they come here, they should find joy. They shouldn't find us bickering with one another because the, we cannot help the situation with the elevator. By the way, the elevator's fine. It has to do something with the companies and the contracts and all kind of legal stuff that you and I don't really know about. Right? We let Wendell handle that. But we need to keep in mind that people watch how we act in church. But not just when we're in church, but when we're out and about. But see, our, our attitudes are often geared towards our interests. Because I have found as a pastor, people are a lot more happy to talk to you if it has to do about their interests. Whether that's maybe their career, their favorite sports teams, or their favorite hobbies. We are so dedicated and devoted to things like this. But we are seldom dedicated to the things of God. Seldom are we dedicated to things of God. Now when I look across the sanctuary, I see people that weren't dedicated a year ago that are dedicated now. So I give God praise. But in the same sentence, I look around and see people that might be here, but they're not dedicated. We call on them and need them. They're not there. Right? So we need to take worship seriously. And if we're not careful, the less that you prioritize worship, the more problems that you're going to have. Now, I'm not teaching a prosperity gospel there. I'm not saying the more that you prioritize worship, the more money you're going to have in your bank account. I'm not saying that. But the more that you have the priority of worship correct in your life, the more everything else can follow suit. And so when we come to Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14... We find that the Lord addresses the priest. Now, this past Sunday, we opened up and started talking about how how the Lord said that he loved them. And Israel came back at him real quick and said, how have you loved us? How, How can this be? The people of Israel had gotten so far away from God honoring worship that they had a hard time knowing God's love because they weren't spending time with God himself. And so what happened in Israel is that the demise of the nation of Israel started with the priest. And it trickled down. And what we're going to see tonight is that the priest of Israel had become very lazy to the things of God. They were not doing what God had told them to do. So tonight we're going to look at the problems of the priest. But next week we're going to look at the product of the priest. Right? The product of the problem that the priest had. And so tonight we're just going to kind of hit the surface a little bit. But God had given their ancestors the very best. God had led their ancestors out of slavery in Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the desert, given them the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, and provided for them all the way, even against enemies. And when you and I get to Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, we're just 400 years before Christ shows us how quickly we can get away from Him in worshiping biblically. Is our worship biblical? Because the problems the priest had is that they were not biblical. I want to give you an illustration before we read our scripture tonight. Shane Pruitt is a youth pastor, a very well-known youth pastor, and a very well-known theologian commentator. He came up with something that he calls the four-generation fade. And I'm afraid that this entire you know, country, as far as Christianity goes, is experiencing the effects of the four-generation fate. Let me show you generation number one. Parents 
don't make church a high priority for their kids. And I put in parentheses there. He didn't say this. I said the parentheses part. That means being there every time the doors are open. Right? So parents don't make it a priority. That's the generation one. Generation two is when it transitions to those kids then grow up and make church a less priority for their kids because why would they? Their parents weren't in church. And then generation three, those kids grow up and make church no priority for their kids. And then you get the fourth generation where those kids grow up without a biblical knowledge of God whatsoever. And so that's the trickle-down effect. When you don't prioritize worship in your home, it trickles down. And you no longer have time to play the blame game. And say, well, you didn't teach my children this, church, or you didn't do this, church. Well, hey, guess what, parent? That's your job, right? Church is just supposed to be a supplement of that, of what's supposed to be happening in the home. So if you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to look at Malachi 1, verses 6 through 14. If you are physically able, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. A son, and by the way, verse 6, we're going to spend a lot more time in verse 6 than the other verses. It's very important. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. I want you to underline the phrase, Lord of hosts. O priest who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? God answers that in verse 7. By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Do you see how many times the Lord of hosts is used here? Verse 10. Oh, that they, oh, that there, excuse me. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. God cannot tolerate sin. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, you see how much satire and going back and forth there is here? What a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity we have to look into your word tonight. Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us for our sins for where we fail you, and Lord, that you would move in a powerful way during this worship service. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, you may be seated. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try to do it in three simple points tonight. I want to ask you, what kind of problems were the priests of Israel having at this time? Well, number one, they disrespected God's name. They disrespected God's name. Now, every single one of you have a name. And your name is important to you, right? I mean, you want people to call you by your name. You don't want somebody to come up to you and say, Hey, you, all the time, right? You want to be called and addressed by your name. Your name is unique and your name is special. Why? Because it represents you. And in Malachi 1.6, God makes it clear that the people had disrespected God's name. And God's name was very important and is very important to him. That's a common theme we find in the Old Testament. God's name is important. 
Look at Malachi 1.6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts? To you, O priest, who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? Malachi turns the tables on the priest. Malachi is showing that the demise that Israel has experienced is at the hands of the priest. And next week we're going to do a little bit more study on the tribe of Levi and the priesthood and why they became the priesthood and all those different things within the tribe of Israel. But just as names are important and special to you and I, they were very important in the Old Testament. If you go back to Genesis, you can look upon chapters upon chapters in Genesis of names. Genealogy, right? Names upon names upon names. And you can even flip a few pages from Malachi and go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and find names upon names of Jesus' genealogy and his lineage. Now, names were important in, in the Old Testament, and God had many different names. I just want to give you a few of God's names in the Old Testament. I think I have this. It's, if it's not on your paper, it's on the screen. God is known in the Old Testament as El Shaddai. The Lord God Almighty. He's known as Elion, the Most High God. Adonai, which means Father. Yahweh, Lord or Jehovah. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord my banner. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. And there's so many other names of God. And so God has done so much for these people. And let me remind you, God has done so much for us. What I want you to see in this text tonight, do you see how many times they question God? How have we polluted you, O oh Lord? Not us. How have we done this? Not us. And you and I are the same way. When problems are confronted, oh, not me. I would never do that. I believe there's two things we need to look at to see how the priest disrespected God's name. Number one, the priority of honor. Look at the first part of verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? God commands honor and majesty, respect and reverence. Now, in the Old Testament, it was very common for children to be expected to obey their parents because of Exodus 20, 12, right? And that is the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments is honor thy father and mother. The Jews took that very seriously. Very seriously in the way that they respected their parents. That was important to them. So essentially what God is saying here, where's your priority of honor? You want your parents to listen to you, excuse me, your children to listen to you as parents, but you're not listening to your parent, me, being the heavenly father. Where is your priority of honor? You're wanting your children to honor you, but you're not honoring me. That's what the Lord is essentially saying here. Now what is so interesting here. Uh, I think, is that the word father in the Hebrew is the word ab or abba. It's a, it's sometimes it's ab, sometimes it's abba. But it is found 1,073 times in the Old Testament. Now, not all of those times are in reference to God the Father, but I think it's important that you see that God allows us to call him father. I mean, God gives us that ability and that distinction. And so if God allows us to call him father, shouldn't we give him the honor and actually treat him like he is our father and listen to him? I've heard many of you say that when you were younger, you say, hey, when I was younger, if I disobeyed mom or dad, they take the belt out. But hey, to watch you live your life as a Christian, you don't act like that. You might have obeyed your earthly mom and dad. But how are you obeying your heavenly father? I mean, I'm proud of you for obeying mom and dad, but that's what's happening here. God is telling the priest, hey, you're teaching the people in the synagogue to obey their parents, but you're not setting the example by obeying me as the heavenly father. And we do the same thing. Our priority of honor is all out of whack. Dr. Warren Wearsby said, the priests who were supposed to honor God's name were disgracing it before the people and the Lord. The priests were supposed to be God's children, yet they weren't honoring their father. They were called to be God's servants, yet they showed no respect for their master. And the priest and the people of Israel taught obeying your parents. And that was so strict for them. And God is saying, why don't you give the same thing for me? Now, that word honor, I want you to look at that word honor in your text. That word honor comes from the Hebrew word kabod, 
And it literally means glory and splendor. So essentially the Lord is saying, why are you not finding glory in me? Why are you not finding joy and splendor and honor and majesty? You're going to other places to find it. Now, there's 200 times that this word occurs. And out of those 200, 142 times it's translated to glory. Now this is by ESV translation. So often it is glory here, or excuse me, honor, not glory, is translated to honor. So the people of Israel did not find glory in the Lord. They did not revere or respect his name. So the priority of honor was not present in their lives. And doesn't that sound like you and I? Now, I want you to look at, secondly, the particular name that is used. Not only the priority of honor, but we need to look at the particular name for God that is used here. It's not El Shaddai. It's not Adonai. It is Lord of hosts. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. If you look at the second part of verse 6, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, right? The priests are mentioned. They're called out. Who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? Now, the Lord confronts the priests on the disrespecting of his name. And they come back with the answer, well, how do we despise your name? If God calls out your sin, don't ask him why or how. Just bow down and ask for forgiveness. And we say amen, but we don't do that. We might not verbally ask these questions, but with our actions, we say, God, I know better than you do. And that's not how we should be. But we're very similar to these priests. We have some of the same problems these priests do. Because when you disobey God, you're disrespecting his name. Honestly, you are. When you say the Lord's name in vain, guess what? You're disrespecting his name. Those are all parts of disrespecting his name. Now, I want to look at that particular name. Now, let me give you an illustration. When a child takes a, a cookie from the jar, and the parent comes, confronts the child, and the child says, Who, me? No, I didn't take a cookie. The parent says, You the only other person in this house, and I didn't take a cookie. Well, it wasn't me. And now, doesn't that sound silly? That's how we are. We are just as silly when we say, God, it wasn't me. Or, God, don't you see that so-and-so is a bigger sinner than I? And so in verse 6, we need to see that the priests are the ones who are blamed. They're the ones who are addressed here. Robbie Gallaty said, these were the religious and political leaders of Israel. That is, they were the representatives of both God and his people. They were the ministerial servants in the temple, commissioned to carry out sacrifices and lead the festival and feast. The depth of their failure is seen in that despite their privileged position, they despise God. So one thing that's hard for you not to understand is that the way uh, the New Testament New Testament church is set up is not the way the Old Covenant was. The priests were representatives of God to the people. That's not necessarily what I am. You might think that's what I am, but we're actually all supposed to be representatives of God to lost people. But there, that was just for the priests. That was their job to facilitate the sacrifices. It's my job to shepherd, but they were more facilitators, not necessarily shepherds in that sense. And so uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is that the priests were falling down on the job. And they were disrespecting God in the process. Now, the word despise is very interesting here when you study this word. It comes from a Hebrew word, bazaar. And bazaar literally means ongoing and continued disrespect. God is not talking about one incident where they disrespected his name. He's talking about an ongoing offense. Now, what is really interesting is when you study this word and you look at where else it is used... The same word despised is found in Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. So what is that? That's the story of Jacob and Esau. Ooh. Now who was mentioned in verses 2 through 5? Jacob and Esau, right? And so it is no accident that the same Hebrew word bazaar that you find here in verse 6 is also in Genesis 25, 34. Okay, y'all don't think it's as cool as I do, but that's really cool. Right? That the languages kind of connect there. That is not by an accident, in my opinion. I believe this same word is used on purpose. Let me show you where it's used. Genesis 25, 34 says, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. 
continual disrespect. Not a one-time thing, but an ongoing level of disrespect. Now, the priest despised the name of God. But all throughout Malachi, you're going to find the word, the Lord of hosts. Now, in the Hebrew, I didn't put this in your sheet. I meant to, but take a picture of that if you need to. All right, Lord of hosts, it comes from the Hebrew word Yahweh, right? Lord is Yahweh there. Now, the word host is from the Hebrew word sabah. So we have Yahweh sabah. If we were all Hebrews, we would say that. So let's say that together. Yahweh sabah. Let's say it together. Yahweh sabah. So that means, if we were speaking Hebrew, the Lord of hosts. Now, some of y'all thought that was weird. Do not go to Israel and say Yahweh Sabah. They do not speak that anymore. It is just a written language. So don't do that. But we have Yahweh Sabah. Now, this phrase, Lord of hosts, is found more in Malachi than in any other book in the Bible. Out of all the times that the phrase Yahweh... Oh, my goodness. Yahweh... All right, so every time, every time this is mentioned at least once, there are a bunch of books in the Old Testament that mention Yahweh Sabah. But I'm going to ask Kay to show the next graphic. Out of all these times that it's mentioned, Malachi mentions it. Out of all the times you find the Lord of hosts, you will find that phrase 43.6% of the time out of Malachi. So that's, he's the winner, right? Haggai also uses it a lot. He mentions it a lot. We studied Haggai. Also, Zechariah, 21.8% of the time that you find this word, you find it in Zechariah. And then we go all the way down to Amos. You find this phrase, Yahweh Sabah, 6.1% of the time in Amos, 5.9% of the time in Jeremiah, 47 in Isaiah, and then on and on and on. And there's a lot of them I didn't mention that are less than 1%. And so that's kind of a big deal that 43.6% of the time that you find Yahweh Sabah is in Malachi. It's almost like he has a licensing on this word. So let me ask you the question, why is this phrase used in Malachi more than any other book? Now, we're not going to study this phrase the rest of the time in Malachi. We're doing it tonight. That's it. It's going to be used time and time and time again. You say, how many times is it used? Well, it depends on what translation you have. So I think the answer can be found when we look at the time period of this book. In the post-exilic period of Malachi, the small province of Judah was a very small colony of the huge Persian Empire. I want to remind you that there's less than 50,000 people living at Judah at the time of Malachi. And when you look at the entire Persian Empire, this is not a lot of people. These people in Judah don't have an army. Now, that word sabah in the Hebrew, to translate that literally, means armies. It's translated in the English language to host, but it literally means armies. So, when Malachi says Yahweh sabah, he's talking about, and by the way, Yahweh is a very serious name for the Lord, right? Especially in the Hebrew. So, it's Jehovah, right? And Jehovah means almighty God, all-powerful God. So, he is saying, look, Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. And so Israel viewed themselves as a minute nation, as a nation that didn't have any power, they didn't have any prestige, they didn't have any soldiers to fight for them. So when the Lord of hosts is used in Malachi more than any other book in the Bible, he's reminding them that although you don't have physical human armies, you have a father, right, an Abba, who has the armies of angels. And that's what he's reminding them of. Now don't you think that's cool? I mean, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabah. He's our Lord of hosts. He's our Lord of armies. And they were disrespecting that name. And you and I do it too. Not only did they disrespect God's name, secondly tonight, they disobeyed God's necessities. Now, when I say necessities... I'm talking about God's necessary law, right? I'm talking about the old covenant law that they were disobeying. Now, in these verses, we're going to see that God's going to show them what they did specifically to render this. Now, God's just coming out and telling them how they messed up. So if you ever get upset at me for saying, well, you know, you, you told me I messed up, you stepped on my toes and yada, yada, yada. Hey, I mean, I got a good example here of how God did that to the priest, right? Right? All right, let me show you three things. Number one, we need to show that the uh, priests were guilty of polluted sacrifices. Look at verses 7 through 8. 
by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Now, there were, there were guidelines and laws for the priest. In Leviticus chapter 22, verses 18 through 25, and in Deuteronomy 15, 21, you're going to find that priests were not to present a sacrifice that was not acceptable to the Lord, right? It had to be without spots, right? Spotless. That's why Jesus, when he died, he had to be perfect, right? Because all of the sacrifices that were presented in the old covenant couldn't be blind. They couldn't be lame. They couldn't be speak. They couldn't even have a spot on them. And so what happened is the priest got lazy, like a daisical, lethargic, whatever L word you want to use, maybe even loser, right? They were losers because they weren't obeying the Lord. And so they offered up sacrifices that were polluted. Now, here's the thing. The people would come to the temple. The temple had been rebuilt, rebuilt in Jerusalem. And they would offer up these animals to the priest and say, here's my sacrifice. The priest's job was to inspect that animal to see whether or not it was fit for sacrifice. And so instead of going back to the people and saying, hey, ma'am, I'm sorry, but this lamb has a spot on the underside that you couldn't see, I'm going to have to give that back to you because God said in Leviticus 22 and Deuteronomy 15 that I cannot give anything that has spots. They didn't do that. Why? Not only did they disobey God's necessities, they were more worried about pleasing people than they were God. And the church is guilty of it today. I mean, we would rather have people come than people obey the word. That's not my philosophy. If you want to come, great, but you're going to need to obey the word. If you're going to want to join the church, you actually need to believe what we believe. I mean, I've had people in my office that say, I don't believe that. I said, well, you can't join and they look at me and they say, what? I mean, to join a church means that you align with their beliefs. And so the, the priest here, they, they were totally off the rails. The word defiled that is used here can also mean unclean or polluted. Now, the priest, they knew that God did not want these unclean sacrifices. They got to the point where they didn't care. But how often do you and I Give God what's left in our lives instead of what's first. And here was really, here's what's really sad about that. Is sometimes we even do that in our ministries. If you lead a ministry, you need to give God what's first. And I know a lot of y'all don't like to plan. Did you know God talks about planning in his word? It's biblical, not just because Pastor Brady's OCD. It's biblical. Right? And so we need to do a better job. Because people see our ministries. One of the best compliments we got about this past trunk or treat, the police chief emailed us and said, that was such an organized event. That's good. Are all our events that organized? Can we do better? And I'm not naming names. But we can do a lot better. Right? We don't want to offer polluted sacrifices on our own. They might not be animals, but we, do we always give God our best? Well, we had it. That, hey, I did it. No, did you do it well? What if I came up here every week and I just said, Well, I gave you a sermon. and I didn't study. I didn't try, but I gave it to you. That'd get old after a while, right? But hopefully you could tell hours upon hours upon hours go into this. So you're like, okay, he's putting into this, so I'm going to come listen. But what about our ministries? Are we putting into our ministries? You might not be getting a lot out of your ministry because you're not putting a lot into it. How can God honor something that you're polluting? So we see polluted sacrifices. Secondly, we see problematic respect. Look at verse 8. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. Now you have to see in verse 8 that God has a sense of humor. Look what God says. Look in verse 8. Present that to your governor. So they're not giving God the best, and he says, you're not going to give the Persian government that, so why are you going to give that to me? 
I mean, that's problematic respect, and we are guilty of that as well. Here we see the Lord pose a rhetorical question, and it's a problematic respect. Essentially, God is saying their governor, meaning the leader of their little province, would not accept their sacrifices, so why should the Lord of hosts accept it? I think Ray Clinton made a great point here. The governor would not be pleased or favorable toward them, and they would not be so foolish as to think otherwise. But God's people had greater respect for their earthly rulers than for the Lord. Let me encourage you with something, and I'm not trying to offend anybody. You should talk more about God than you do about politics. Politics, I get it. It's important. But if you believe in the Lord, he's going to take care of it all anyway. And if people are, if you're so worried about whether somebody's a Democrat or whether somebody's a Republican or yada, 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 but you're not worried if they're saved or not, there's a problem there. There's problematic respect, right? And we need to keep that in mind. And so the purpose of the sacrificial system was to be a testimony to give God glory and to show God's grace for his people. But due to the priests disobeying God's laws for these sacrifices, it misinterpreted God's character to the people, causing the people to think that God will accept less than. That's what the priests were teaching. You know, I'm just going to take this. And so when somebody brings an animal that has a spot on it and they get by with it, they're like, oh, well, God accepts less than my best. Let me go find a blind animal and I'll take my good animal to the government for my taxes. Or I'll take the good animal and eat it for supper instead of the blind one. God's going to take the blind one and you and I do the same. Well, I'm serving in ministry. I might not be giving my best, but I'm leading this ministry. I'm teaching Sunday school, so that's just enough. No, give your all. Give your all to the king. Don't have that problem of problematic respect. Don't have a problem of that. You should respect God and the things of God. Now, thirdly, we see a peculiar response. If you look at verse 9, And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show any favor to, or show, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the reason this is peculiar is because God is allowing them an opportunity to repent. And God is showing them and will show them in the next few verses that they cannot give an offering if there is still sin in their heart. Contrary to popular belief, God cannot hear your prayers if there's sin in your life. Unrepentant sin. You have to ask God to forgive you of your sins. I mean, you can pray all you want, but God can't enter, the Holy Spirit can't intercede on your behalf if there's sin there because God can't tolerate sin. And so God is telling the priest, you've got to repent. He's giving them an opportunity. Because if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, or verse 2, you're, you're going to find a conditional phrase at the beginning of verse 2 in chapter 2, right? Their punishment that's coming later on is a conditional punishment. God has given them an opportunity to turn this thing around. I mean, they got problems, but they can turn them around. But it's a peculiar response. The fact that God would allow us, it's peculiar that God would give us grace. It's peculiar that God would allow us to turn over our wicked ways to him. Because that's not like the rest of the world. But that's like God. Now, in verse 9, I think we can learn a really important truth. Before God accepts your gift, God inspects your heart. That can be your gift of service. That can be your gift to him. And before you think you're God's gift to the earth, like some of us think, let's just be honest, some of us think we're God's gift to the earth. No, God's gift to you as a son. That's the gift, not you and I, right? And so we need to remember that, that God inspects the heart before he accepts the gift now, so far tonight, we've named two problems that the priest had. They disrespected God's name, and they disobeyed God's necessity. Finally, they despised God's nature. Now, I'm going to leave it the ball in your court to read through verses 10 through 14. I'm just going to give you three things about these verses. These verses kind of repeat what verses 7 through 9 already said. God kind of repeats them. Why does God repeat them in different ways? Because we as people need reminders again and again. Because we usually don't hear it the first time. Number one thing you should see is that they should have shut the doors. So verse 10 literally says, Oh, that there were one among you that would have shut the doors. God is saying, Better would my temple be with the door shut, 
like it was a few years ago when it wasn't being rebuilt than for you to despise it. For then you to defile it. God would rather be not worship than for us to defile his worship. Does that make sense? Because God doesn't want to be disrespected. God does not want to be despised. So what you see here is God's righteous anger. He's mad. He's upset. And he has a right to be. I believe this goes to show that we cannot truly worship God with sin present in our lives. And you and I need to shut the doors. If this becomes a den of mockers, then a place of worship. You and I need to shut the doors if this becomes a place where we're more worried about programs than we are about the prophet. This place needs to be shut if we're more worried about other people's problems, hello, wake up, than we are about Jesus. I mean, some of us go to church for the programs. Some of us go to church for other people's problems. Some of us go to church for the pettiness. You say, nobody here would ever do that. Why don't you put a bug in my office and listen? Why don't you listen to your pastor cry? Because people here don't understand what it means to worship. What it means to bow, bow down. Now you couldn't actually hear me crying because I don't audibly cry. But tears do fall on your behalf. Because we come in and we say, oh, I'm coming to church because I want to know what the juicy drama is. Or pastor, I'm upset because you're not having this program that I used to love. Programs don't necessarily mean glorification to God. Sometimes programs pump egos more than they praise God. Honestly. Now, I'll resign after the service. But, I, I mean, I, I'll just be honest with y'all. We need to shut the doors if we're not praising the Lord. We need to shut the doors if we're not giving His name praise. And if you're more into programs, problems, and pettiness, then you need to find another church. Because I want everybody here to be saturated with the gospel. And to be so infatuated with God that they want more and more. Secondly, we see that someday everyone will worship. Look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. What I want to remind you about this verse is God is essentially saying, Israel, you're not going to worship me? Okay, fine, dandy. Everybody's going to worship me one day. Now, this, I believe, is a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Some will try to say this was a field when Jesus came because this is alluding to the Gentiles being able to worship. This is kind of letting them know, you're Jews, you're not going to be the only ones that can have access to God. Us as Gentiles, we're going to have it. I think this verse is a reference to the Messianic Age, which is yet to come. What's the Messianic Age, right? The millennium, right? Where we are going to worship the Lord forever and ever and ever. It's a parallel to Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's going to happen. And only two of y'all said amen. Where's our worship? Where's our praise? Because if we were at a Carolina Clemson game, we'd be like, woo! But we get to church and we don't care anymore. We don't worship anymore. We go through the motions. I know, I know something's going on when Paul Blethyn's smiling at me. I know we're getting, we getting warmed up. Don't leave me yet, guys. So they should have shut the door. Someday everyone will worship. But thirdly, sadly, the priest had the wrong attitude. They had an attitude problem. You can read verses 12 through 14. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and that, and that its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. And he goes on and on and on. So verses 12 through 14 recapture the attitude of this entire passage. And as we get ready to close, I just want to ask you, what is your attitude like? What is your attitude like towards the Lord? Because you're probably here tonight and you're like, Pastor... I'm not a priest. I don't have to find animals and put them on an altar and, and gut them and all that kind of stuff. No, you don't. But if you're a Christian, some of us have the same problems that we've talked about tonight. 
Some of us are guilty of disrespecting God's name. Some of us are guilty of disobeying God's necessities, which are his rules and his laws for us. We're not under the law, but God does give us things to follow in his word. And then thirdly, some of us are despising God's nature. You say, Pastor, what does it mean to despise God's nature? To despise God's nature is to despise who he really is and his character. To despise the very being of God himself. Not just his name, but actually who God is. Maybe, just maybe, you're here tonight, and you're not as dedicated to worship as you're dedicated to your career, as you're dedicated to your hobbies, or your favorite sports teams. Woe be us if we can tell you more about what happened 100 years ago than we can tell you what happened 2,000 years ago. And it's written down. Woe be us. And if you and I are not careful, very quickly, we, be, we can become like the priest of Israel. And very quickly, you and I can have the same problems that they have. Because once we start to slip in our worship of God, it will not be long until you and I are no longer worshiping God, but we're worshiping self. And one of the biggest travities in the church today is that we go to churches and we raise the banner of Jesus, but we don't worship Jesus. We use church to worship self and not Jesus. And I think those that do that will be held accountable. So during this time of invitation, I want to invite you, I want you to think long and hard about the problems of these priests. I want you to examine your heart, and I just want you to pray during this time, God, are there any problems in my heart? And you don't have to stand. If you want to stand in a minute when we sing, you can, but you don't have to. Don't just do it out of tradition. If you're going to stand, that means you're going to praise. If you're going to stay seated, that means you're going to pray. I think we all need to have a time tonight where we slow down and examine our hearts and see, are there any problems in this passage that are present in my heart? Father God, I ask, Lord, that you would just bless and anoint, Lord, this time of invitation. Lord, I'm well aware that there, I know there's one person here that has these problems, and it's me. Lord, there are times that I disrespect your name. Lord, time and time again, I disobey your necessities. And Lord, when I do that, I despise your nature. God, forgive me when I hurt you. God, forgive me when I sin. And Lord, I just pray during this time of invitation that if there's anybody on the sound of my voice that is dealing with any of these problems that we've mentioned, Lord, that you would deal with their heart and that you would deal with them. Lord, if they need to stay seated and pray, lead them to do that. But if they want to stand and praise, that's up to them. I ask, Father, that you'd move during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say. This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address, and you can contact us if you made a decision. Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all to the glory of God.